What happens to your body when you don't eat? Well, you might experience ketogenesis, headaches, or die. But how long until you die? And is there any benefit to this fasting thing, really? In this video, I'm going to answer those questions. Millions of people have fasted throughout eternity for religious holidays such as Ramadan or Yom Kippur or for hunger strikes. And more and more and more people are trying out this intermittent fasting thing or a ketogenic diet. I wanted to find out what the real answer was, what the consensus is. And I want to understand what physically happens to the body when you don't eat. When do things become dangerous? What happens when you start eating again after fasting? And is there any merit to this actual intermittent fasting thing or not eating for an extended period of time for health? Importantly, this is a deep dive into the science of it. This isn't medical advice. Please talk to your doctor before eating 17 pizzas in one hour or fasting until the next eclipse. So let's start with the energy cascade. Where does your body get the initial energy from? Well, your body's using something called ATP at all times. And all ATP is, is just something that's used to move or push certain things in your body. And usually this ATP comes from the breakdown of glucose or sugar. What if we run out of glucose? What if we run out of sugar? And so for the entirety of this video, I promise I'm not gonna eat anything at all. So I can see what happens when I fast for an extended period, sorry. So. Okay. When I fast for the entirety of this video, where does my energy come from? I failed. Damn it. Okay, so what happens after one day of fasting like me? Well, the first thing many people will notice is a headache. Your body is initially using the glucose you have right now to go through glycolysis or to break down that glucose to generate ATP so your cells can do the things that keep you alive. And without this energy, the cells can't function well. So your body needs this ATP to make sure you can still move your arm, breathe, and beat your heart. So after that blood glucose is gone, what happens? Well, you die. No, your body has stores of glycogen, which is just lots of glucose molecules linked together, that are taken from the liver usually, and also skeletal muscle, to kind of quickly replete those levels of glucose in the body. So those glucose molecules can be broken down to generate more ATP. This is why people carb load usually the day before a big marathon, right? Because they want to replete and make sure those glycogen stores are as big as possible. So when they're doing those long runs, they can use those glycogen stores to generate ATP, so they don't have to start drawing energy from the less efficient and more difficult place to draw energy from your fat and muscle. And that's where days two to three come in. So days do two to three, goodbye glycogen, hello fat and muscle. If we are undergoing intense exercise, we can actually exhaust our glycogen stores as quickly as 80 minutes into exercise. So at rest, each of our muscle cells contains about 1 billion ATP molecules. And those can be used and recycled every two minutes. All of them used and recycled every two minutes. During intense exercise, that ATP production and use can increase a thousand fold. So one trillion ATP molecules. And even if you've been fasting for two to three days, our body still needs that ATP to do all those things I just talked about. So what happens when you're out of glycogen? Well, one of the first places your body might look is triglycerides or fats. And triglycerides are these basically tri, three, glycerides, glycerol molecules, so are then broken down into free fatty acids and glycerol. The body then sends those things to the liver, which converts those things into glucose and ketone bodies. And around this point, you might start experiencing confusion, sleepiness, GI upset, and muscle aches. And all that is, is really just all your body struggling to find that ATP. So after about a week, your body might be very well versed at using those ketones as an energy source. So they might start using those triglycerides primarily for energy, as opposed to what's usually used primarily for energy, which is your carbohydrates or your sugar. However, given that we are completely fasting, there's a chance we might exhaust those fat stores pretty quickly. And once we actually go through those fat stores, the next place to look is muscle. After about two weeks, things really start to slow down. At around this time, organs probably aren't functioning optimally with your kidneys, probably one of the first places to show some renal damage. And your body also has increased systemic release of inflammatory factors. Chances of severe neurological and physiological changes come into play here. That could be things such as delirium, psychosis, Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome, which is just something that happens when you don't have a certain vitamin to help your brain work properly, renal failure, colitis, and more. And when malnourishment hits, you might start to lose your hair, women might stop having periods, and we all would become extremely weak. 
This level of fasting is usually extremely dangerous and very difficult. Overall, once you hit above 10 days, things most of the time start to go downhill. But when do you actually die? When does the starvation kill you? Most people, and again, this isn't advice, please don't ever do this, but can usually survive about 30 days of fasting, assuming they're drinking water. After that 30 day point, it really comes down to who you are. For example, children are much more prone to kind of this malnourishment and will probably die quicker if they're not eating. Also the elderly and the weak and elderly or the low BMI and elderly probably would die sooner as well. Also, if you're obese, you might be able to live longer off those triglycerides, right? A study showed that people who have a larger BMI, so a very high BMI, usually can actually tolerate about a 20% weight loss compared to people with a more in range BMI, which can only tolerate around an 18% weight loss before things start to get pretty bad. And again, the reason you die right after fasting is what I was talking about all before. Your body just can't generate enough ATP to keep your cells alive and happy. And if your cells aren't alive and happy, they may lice or explode. And when they explode, they release release certain electrolytes, altering the balance of not only the electrolytes, but also acids and bases. So maybe your blood might become more acidic, which can really alter everything in the body. For example, say your heart muscle cells stop working. Well, if your heart muscle cells stop working, they can't squeeze oxygenated blood to the rest of your body. If you can't get oxygenated blood to your body, your body can't go through something that uses oxygen very nicely to generate ATP. You can't generate the ATP, you'll die fairly quickly. This is what happens when people have strokes, heart attack, and why it's so important to see if we can get that heart pumping very quickly. Why we might add oxygenation to their body while pushing the heart as well, so we can push that oxygenated blood through the body. But a normal weight person, on average, they did a couple studies, can probably last two to three months before death. Gandhi actually undertook 17 fasts, the longest of which being 21 days. But the world record holder was a guy named Angus Barbieri. He was a 456 pound guy from Scotland, um, 17 years old. But he fasted for about 382 days. He left at 180 pounds, losing about 300 pounds. He did, however, have certain supplements of yeast, uh, electrolytes, water, of course. Um, but importantly, most of the things he was given, all the things he was given was no calories. And I'd say 95 to 99% of the world probably couldn't tolerate that. But say we do this big fasting for some reason um, and we start to eat again. What happens? Well, it actually can be pretty dangerous. And I see people that go through something called refeeding syndrome all the time when they're kind of in and out or around the ICU. And why does this happen? Well, people that usually go into the ICU are so sick they can't eat and maybe we're not even giving them food kind of through their veins at this point either. So maybe they've gone maybe seven days or 14 days without food, but we've been kind of repleting their electrolytes and giving them water to keep them alive. Say they get better, which, would be, which is very nice, at around two weeks and say they can even tolerate food at two weeks, which would be amazing. When they start to eat, right, what happens is you get this huge spike of insulin. And what insulin does is saying, okay, we finally have some food, thank God. Let's push all these things into our cells. Let's move the glucose in, let's move the glucose out. Let's do all these kind of things. But what happens is, is when you're pushing things into cells or out of cells, you're altering the balance of these electrolytes in the body. And that's why people who are usually started to eat again after a long, 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 long time of not eating are usually monitored in the hospital with daily blood draws or something like that. That way we can actually replete their potassium, sodium, magnesium, phosphate, things like this, so they don't get to kind of dangerous levels. But let's talk about the less dramatic thing. What about just simply going for like intermittent fasting to lose weight and then you start eating again? What happens to your weight? Well, unfortunately in overweight individuals, the studies really show that people who do cal caloric restrictions usually gain the weight back. Of course, this isn't always true, right? This is just what the evidence supports. And finally, onto the reality of fasting. Is intermittent fasting actually beneficial? Should people do it to live longer? I don't think so. Or I don't think science knows yet. Regarding overall weight loss, right? There's a bunch of studies that look at biomarkers, weight loss, glycemic control, and things like that. And they actually show the overall energy intake, which is just the amount of calories you're eating in the day, is really what matters. It doesn't matter if you're fasting for a certain amount of time or distributing those calories throughout the day. It's really the overall calories, which makes sense to me. Now, some studies say, right, there might be benefits in neurological disease, metabolic syndromes, cardiovascular diseases. 
And there actually was some exciting evidence about, you know, certain help of fasting when you're going through cancer treatment with things such as tyranase kinase inhibitors. But actually, the most recent scary article was from the American Heart Association, which looked at 20,000 adults and that found that following an eight hour time restricted diet, those people had a 91% higher risk of death from cardiovascular disease than people who weren't going through that kind of intermittent fasting. And it also found that people with heart disease or cancer had a higher risk of cardiovascular death when they were trying this fasting. So again, this is just one study, good number of people around 20,000. Um, but again, it's showing some association, not necessarily cause here. I don't think there's evidence either way that's gonna point me in the recommendation fast or not. I think what there is evidence for is kind of your overall caloric consumption every day. So what do I think overall about everything I just talked about? Well, I think in general, my answer isn't a sexy answer. It's just that moderation is the best. You shouldn't be eating dramatic amounts of food at a certain amount of time for an extended period of time because this can increase your chances for diabetes, metabolic syndromes, cardiovascular disease, things like this, especially when it's associated with the sedentary lifestyle. However, under consumption can actually lead to organ dysfunction, you losing your hair, losing the ability to think properly, kidney issues, delirium, or even death. I think moderation is the best here, and the thing most people ignore is proper sleep and exercise. Again, very boring, but these are the levers you really wanna pull as opposed to some fancy, crazy diet. In regards to diet, think about eating a reasonable amount of food every day and a reasonable quality of food every day. I'll do another post about that as well. But the timing, I don't think the evidence is there yet to support fasting for significant amounts of time during the day. Okay, but overall, what did we learn in this video? Or I learned a lot from this video, it's actually really interesting to me. I hope it was interesting to you as well. Rebound eating can kill you. Refeeding syndrome is a real thing and it can kill you if you are dieting or fasting for a long period of time and then eating again. And finally, intermittent fasting has intermittent benefits. The science isn't fully here that to support or deny its benefit. But that is it. Thank you so much for watching. I'm going to go back to eating my hunk of bread because I fasted for a whole day there, totally. And my glucose needs help. I really need help. I need help. That's it. Thank you so much for watching, and I will see you on the next one. Uh, uh.